to our video today we're going to talk about seed starting now it doesn't seem like a good time to start seeds since outside there's about a quarter of an inch of ice on things with about five inches of snow on top of that and we've spent the last two days trying to keep the ice and snow from building up on the high tunnels and collapsing them uh, but it is mid-february and that's kentucky weather so if you don't like it hang around for two or three days and it'll probably change but we've got a fire going here in the greenhouse and it's pretty warm. So we're going to talk about starting seeds today. So first of all, let's talk about why we would want to take the time and the effort to take a seed, grow it in some kind of container in a greenhouse or in our own house for several weeks and then transplant that into the garden. Well, there are several good reasons, but the main one being time. You save a lot of time using a transplant instead of direct seeding. Take a tomato, for instance, if you direct seed a tomato in May when the soil is warmed up around here, that's when we would transplant tomatoes, uh, then versus taking a transplant that's already uh, two months old and putting that in the ground in May, you've already saved two months on your season. So you can get earlier fruiting and you can get more in a season. So that's the main thing is savings of time. There are other benefits such as weed control. Now, if you take a if you direct seed, we'll stick with our tomato example. If you direct seed a tomato, well, that ger seed has to germinate along with all the other weed seeds in the soil. And let me tell you, the weed seeds are going to outcompete that tomato seed. So you're going to have a hard time keeping the weeds down, keeping it controlled, and they're going to compete with that tomato plant. So it's going to be at a disadvantage already. But if you can maintain clean soil, you can till the weeds before you put that transplant in, and it's going to have a big advantage. And it's also, even if weeds come up after you've transplanted that tomato plant, then you have a lot easier time uh, getting those weeds out of there and, and mulching or using some other kind of weed control. So that's a big benefit too, is weed competition. It really helps if you start with the transplant to give that transplant a heads up. Another reason to use a transplant rather than direct seed is that you can choose a wider selection of varieties. If you go to your local nursery, your garden center, a uh, local greenhouse, then you're only going to get a certain amount of varieties. You're, you're going to be limited to what's available and when that's available. So unless they have it in stock at that time and the variety you want, then you're sort of out of luck. But if you can start those seeds yourself, then you've really opened yourself up to a, a world of different varieties that you can start on your own time and have them when you want. And you can produce them in the way that you want as well. So that's a big advantage, especially if, you, if you're a seed saver, you want to save your seeds if you have varieties that you're not going to find at other places. So unless you have a friend that's willing to start those for you, then you're going to need to learn to start those yourself. Seed starting is fairly easy, uh, but there are some basic principles that you have to remember in order to be successful. And I'm going to try to keep this a short video. I could talk a long time about uh, seed starting because there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. But the basics are pretty simple, so we're going to start with those. First of all, you need a seed, a viable seed. That seems obvious, but go ahead and start with good seed that you know is good. That way, if you have an issue with germination or something's not coming up or something's not growing, then you realize it's probably not the seed because you've got good seed. But if you start with seed that's a little questionable, then maybe you really don't, you're not able to identify the problem that you're having. So start with good seed and that'll save you a lot of headaches. Uh, second, all you need is some kind of container, uh, you need some kind of soil mix, and you need a place to put it. So if you, if you get all those things in order, then seed starting will be easy. First of all, let's talk about the container. Uh, you can use, and that's the great thing about seed starting, you can use any kind of container you want. Uh, find anything that will hold soil, and you can start a seed in it. Just make sure it has drainage holes in the bottom because you don't want all the water pooling in there and that seed will definitely drown and rot. 
So uh, old yogurt containers, plastic containers, plastic cups, paper cups, uh, anything that you can think of uh, that's the proper size will be able to start seeds in. Um, we have a lot of different options that we use. Uh, our standard um, four inch pot, plastic pot, we use an awful lot for a lot of our transplants because it gives us a large stocky transplant uh, to sell. If we are starting tr transplants for our field production, we're gonna use something different. This is a plug tray. This is, a, I think, a 36, so it has 36 cells. This will make a really big transplant. We normally don't use a transplant this size. This is a pretty big one. Uh, we'll have other sizes of these we use. Our normal size is probably 100. This is, a, I think it's called a 98. It's got 98 cells in it. But it produces a great uh, size transplant. And this, we use this one for peppers. We use this one for our, our, our cabbage, our broccoli, our cold crops. Uh, we use this one for tomatoes. Uh, so depending on the size, you can use these plug trays. Now, a lot of commercial growers will use these because they can be reused year after year after year. Uh, you can do that with, with any other plastic pot. In fact, if you get your little uh, insert cell packs that you buy, if you're buying flowers from a greenhouse or something in the spring, you can reuse these. Now, these are very thin. They're not going to last forever. If you're really careful with them, <laughs> you can use them for several years like we do. Uh, but make sure you sterilize anything you reuse. So you can reuse plastic over and over again, but make sure you sterilize it with a 10% bleach solution. So one part, uh, just your st standard bleach and nine parts water. We like to do a bucket or a dunk tank and something. You can just dunk those in there and um, rinse them off after they've set for a little bit. And they're perfectly fine to use again and again. So uh, you can reuse all of those. Uh, we also use the smaller plug trays like this one. This one may be a 288 in order to um, start a lot of stuff at one time. And then we'll keep them in here for a, a, a bit of a bit of time. And then we'll transplant them up into maybe a, a bigger tray or a bigger pot. Uh, you can essentially use any size you want, but make sure you size your container correctly for the plant that you're going to grow. Now, if you start with a little plug tray, like I just showed you, it's only going to, your, your plant's only going to stay in there for two or three weeks before it has to be transplanted into something else. So that allows us to save a lot of space in the early greenhouses by using plug trays, but we'll eventually have to transplant those up. If you are not starting that many plants, then you can start in the, the, the container you want to end up with. It's no problem at all. Uh, but you do remember that, you know, your plant's not going to last as long in this size pot as it is in this size pot before it gets root bound and you're going to need to transplant in something else. So size of your pot is very important. For most crops, something like a three or four inch pot is adequate and makes a good sized transplant. That just really depends on how long you want to grow it out. So this one is made out of peat. Uh, it is a, I think it's a three by three inch peat pot. And the good things about um, these, um, these pots here are that you can plant them directly into the garden. So it's a one-time use, uh, but if you don't like to use plastics, then these are a good option as well. Uh, they work just like the plastic pots, except when you're ready to plant them, the whole thing goes in the garden and this will break down and the roots will just go right through that. So it's not a problem. Uh, we also have something that you can use, they're, they're peat pellets. These are pretty neat as well. These are the Jiffy pellets. I think these are number sevens. They have uh, a little divot in the middle. So when you, they're dry and they're packed, maybe 2,000 a box, they're about five to 10 cents a piece. And when you soak these in water, they're gonna swell up. And then the ones with the little divot are gonna leave a little hole in the middle. You can drop your seed right into that and maybe kind of tuck it in a little bit. And that will go ahead and grow right in that Jiffy pellet. And those are pretty neat. They do have a little bit of a, a, a mesh netting around the side. So once they've grown up, the roots have completely grown through the pellet and you can start to see them coming out, then they'll be ready to transplant. And then if you don't like that little mesh, you can pull that mesh off and then the whole thing goes into the ground. So you can get a lot of these in a small amount of space. And when you're ready to use them, just rehydrate them and use them. So we can use those as well. A lot of people use stuff like egg carton. That, that's a great little uh, seed starting fun thing for kids. You always see kids starting marigold plants in here. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend that too well because these actually aren't that big. So you can't leave the plants in there that long, but it's fun and they'll, they're compostable. In fact, we sell our eggs in these pulp containers 
Uh, that way we can reuse them for things. Um, and you can actually, we compost them if we don't have another use for them, but you can start seeds in them. They do pretty well. It's sort of like a peat pot. And then you can just pull those apart uh, after the plant is big enough to transplant. Some people will actually even put, you know, you know eggshells in their egg carton and use those to hold the seeds. Uh, make sure you put a little hole in the bottom before you do that so the water can drain out. That's not necessary. In fact, that kind of restricts the growth of the, the roots a little bit. If you've got the egg carton, you really don't need the shells, but it's a neat way to reuse some eggshells. We just actually just compost the eggshells or use them in our vermicompost, but it works this way. Just make sure if you want to put that in the garden, break that eggshell up a little bit because those roots will have a hard time getting through that eggshell. It takes a long time for an eggshell to break down in the soil. So those are options. There's lots of other options to make um, either one-time use pots or, re or recyclable pots or reusable pots. A little tool that I found years and years ago, uh, it's well-worn is this little pot maker and i've enjoyed making pots with this and this is to make pots out of newspaper actually any kind of paper but newspaper works the best if you can find newspaper these days the problem with this is, is that newspapers are becoming less and less common used to be people had tons of newspapers they wanted to give you now newspapers are sort of dying out and it's hard to find newspaper but any paper will work uh so newspaper uh, in a strip about this size i don't have the exact measurements uh, but you wrap that around the pot like this. Maybe that's a spindle. I'm not sure what that's called. One of these is a spindle. I don't know the terminology, but it's got the base and the top. And then you kind of crimp that in a little bit and stick it in there and give it a twist. And that's all it takes. That slides off and that's a nice little uh, re uh, recyclable pot you can use there. I have some here. Stick it in a container, fill it with soil. And then when your plant's ready to go in the, in the field, then you can take that whole thing and plant it. And by that point, the newspaper's sort of breaking down really wet. The roots will go right through it really quickly. And that's a good way to reuse some newspaper. And if you have this little tool, you can make, in paper, you can make an infinite number of pots. In fact, we like to make the kids do that in the wintertime. They can make pots. You can go ahead and have, and have them filled with soil, and then they're ready to use. Put them in trays or whatever, and they're ready to use when you're ready to start seed. So that's a great option as well. And that was a fun one uh, that we've used in the past. Now we're going to talk about the soil, but I'm not going to use the word soil anymore because we don't ever use soil when we start seeds indoors. Uh, and that, that's for a variety of reasons. The main one being that soil from the garden is not sterile and it's full of weed seeds. So you're going to have bad luck if you just go out and get soil from the garden and try to start seeds in it without it being sterilized some way so that there's no weed seeds uh, or no pathogens in there. So you're, you're going to just be in the same boat you are if you start in the field direct seeding if you use garden soil. It's also very heavy. It also holds too much water, um, and it's just not very good for growing in containers of this size. So we use something called a soil medium or a soil mix. And this, these are natural mixes, and they can be from a lot of different materials. Uh, but made together, they make the, that perfect environment for that seed to germinate and those roots to grow. It'll really get you a nice, healthy transplant. So let's talk about basic soil mixes. For a new seed starter, the best thing you can do is to go out and buy and purchase a quality soil mix from your nursery or garden center. We use a variety of ones. You really can't go wrong with, with Pro Mix. Uh, this is their germinating mix. It's the the flexible, the flexible usage, it has a little bit finer grain in it, so that one's good for that. Burger we use as well. Uh, so there's lots of uh, options out there for soil mixes. But most soil mixes are made of three components, and I think I have them all separated here. Uh, first of all, it's normally a peat base. Now, peat moss is mined no around here in North America. It, all, it pretty much all comes from Canada. Uh, so it's a mine product that is... Uh, natural. Uh, there's no weed seeds in it. It's, it's sterile. It's very acidic. Uh, so it has a, it has a really low pH. So often when it's used in a soil mix, um, some kind of liming agent is added to raise the pH, but it's normally, um, looks like that. There are two other things that are added to it. You've probably seen this before in your soil mixes. This is perlite. Uh, perlite is, uh, it's the white stuff you'll see in your soil mix. And it has the advantage of being really lightweight and it holds water really well. Now, perlite, as well as the next uh, addition we're going to talk about, 
is a natural material. Perlite's actually an amorphous volcanic glass. So it, it, it's heated, it has, there's some moisture in it. When it's heated, it expands to extremely low density. So it's really light, has air pockets in it, and then it'll hold water and nutrients as well. So that's a, a big part of a soil mix. You'll see those little white perlite pellets in there, and that helps it to be aerated, helps the oxygen get to the roots, and it holds water and nutrients as well. The other component with the soil mix that you'll see is vermiculite. Now that's the little kind of like gray, shiny stuff that's in there. Now this is also a volcanic mineral. It's a phytosilicate mineral actually, and it is heated until it exfoliates. It kind of like sort of explodes, I guess. You might call it rock dander, I guess, exfoliation. That's what it makes me think about. But it's also really light. Uh, it is a two to one clay with a high CEC. So uh, vermiculite holds nutrients really well like clay does, except it's very light. Um, so it doesn't have that weight of, of a normal clay. So you take all of these three components together and then you mix them up and you'll get your typical soil mix. Now, as I said, uh, most soil mixes will add some kind of liming agent, and then most of them will, will, will begin with a little bit of starter fertilizer, some kind of chemical fertilizer, just a broad spectrum with micronutrients in it. You can get it without that. If you're an organic grower, you can get organic mixes that don't have any, any chemicals at all. All these are natural materials. Uh, so if you just want a, a, an organic mix, you can get that as well. We use uh, soil mixes for our early transplants, and actually through most of our transplants, BX has a soil mix that has mycorrhizae and biofungicide in it as well. And that really produces a healthy transplant. If you don't know what mycorrhizae is, it's a fungus that helps the plant absorb nutrients from the soil. So it's pre-inoculated with that, it's natural, um, as is a biofungicide, which is a, it's a healthy bacteria, or and I think, no, it's a fungus, I'm sorry. It's a healthy fungus that sort of colonizes the roots so that the bad funguses can't colonize the roots so it sort of takes their place, but it's a good fungus. So um, biofungicide and mycorrhizae. So if you see that on a soil mix, it's a generally a good thing. You don't have to use it, uh, but you can. So there are lots of options for that. If you take these three things together, and if you have these three components, you can actually buy peat, you can buy perlite, and you can buy vermiculite in large bulk bags. If you take these things together and mix them, then you can actually mix your own soil mix it, I'm not sure that it's any more economical. If you're doing large amounts, it may be, but uh, you're, you're probably better off just to buy, uh, buy a bag of pre-made, pre-mixed stuff. I get a lot of questions about alternatives to going to the store and, and purchasing some kind of pre-made mix. What if I can't? What if they don't have any? What if I want to be uh, self-sufficient to the point that everything comes off our farm? Well, you can use compost. Here's some of our compost that's made on the farm, but that's with some caveats. It doesn't make the best seed starting mix for a couple of reasons. Depending on your, how you compost, we compost in a sort of a cold process, so this is gonna have weed seeds in it. So it's gonna have weed seeds in it. The good thing about it is there's plenty of nutrients in it. Uh, once a transplant gets into there, that, that seed's gonna just take off and explode with growth because it's very rich in nutrients. Uh, but you do have weed seeds, which are going to pop up, and um, that's the main thing. If you can sterilize this in some way, whether either in the summertime solarizing it or using steam or heat, then compost makes a good soil medium, but it's a little heavy and it holds a lot of water, so it can be a little waterlogged. An alternative to, uh, to that by itself is you could actually add some sand. Now, sand by itself does not make a good medium to start seeds in. It just doesn't hold enough water doesn't hold enough nutrients, and you're gonna, you'd are gonna you be constantly watering it. But if you have a source of, of sand that's easy to sterilize, you can just bake uh, sand in your oven and sterilize it. Then you can add it to something like compost, and together, uh, the sand sort of loosens it up a little bit, gives it a little more um, air, air uh, a little bit more air pockets, and makes it a little bit less dense. And then um, it works pretty good that way. So that is an alternative if you want to make sure you sterilize that as well. So I always like to give alternatives. Maybe you uh, maybe you want to try that yourself. Okay, so we have our container, we have our soil mix, and we have our seed. So we're ready to sow that seed. So there are a few things you need to remember when you're talking about starting those seeds. 
And the number one is timing. When do I plant my seed in the container in order to have it ready to transplant into the garden? Well, that really depends on where you're at and your frost-free date. Uh, around here, zone six, we're going to use May 10th, around May 10th as our frost-free date. Everybody around here says that uh, we don't plant until after Derby. Derby's always the first Saturday in May. So we have a sort of a Derby calendar in Kentucky, as you can well imagine. Uh, but normally after that point, after the first or second week in May, you can't really um, count on spring frost. So you're pretty safe after that point. So find whatever date you have as a frost-free date for your frost-sensitive crops. This is a little different for crops that are not frost-sensitive, so we'll just stick with tomatoes for now. So your tomato, you want an eight-week transplant uh, around May 10th or the 1st of May. So you're going to need to start that transplant around the 1st or the 2nd week of March. So you just look at the calendar, count back, and that's when I need to be seeding. We start a little earlier on our crops because we have some ways to protect them. A lot of our crops are going into high tunnels, so we've already sowed some of our early tomato seeds and it's mid-February, but those are going to go into our high tunnel in April. Um, now the crops like cabbage and kale, the things that can take some frost, we will be seeding those this week and we're only looking for a six-week transplant on those. Those will go out end of March. Uh, first of April. So they'll go out really early because they can take some frosts and some freezes. So it really depends on the crop. Now, as far as which crops do I transplant and which crops do I direct seed? I've got a small chart in my book uh, in the chapter on starting seeds that talks about which crops are best transplanted, which crops are best direct seeded. And that really, a lot of that depends on your goal. Here on our farm where we're, we sell vegetables, we have to have a long season uh, we want to have vegetables as long as we possibly can with consistency throughout the season. We transplant almost everything except uh, the large seeded crops like corn and beans. And we can even do that at times if we want to. Last year, we, we transplanted some beans and it works really well. But it takes a lot of greenhouse space we don't have. So direct seed, the big seeded crops like corn, beans, uh, and the, the crops that are root crops uh, that don't really transplant that well. You can transplant carrots, you can transplant beets, but they don't tend to do any kind of crop with the taproot, doesn't tend to do that well when it's transplanted. So um, those are best direct seeded, especially if you're going to have a large amount of them. If you have a large plot of something, then it's going to take a lot of space that a lot of people don't have. So once you've figured out when you want to start your seeds, you can have a good transplant at the proper time to put it into the garden without it being overgrown or root bound. Uh, then you can find that date, put it on your calendar and start sowing your seeds. So let's talk about the main thing when you're sowing seeds is depth. Now, there's a good rule of thumb uh, when we talk about sowing seeds. How deep do I sow my seed? Well, no more than twice the diameter of the seed. So that's your general rule. No more than twice the diameter of the seed. That's about right. So large seeds are going to be pretty deep. Uh, small seeds are going to be very shallow and almost uh, barely covered. A mistake people make is to have a little bitty seed, put it so deep in the soil that it's never going to make it to the surface. Uh, so if it's a really tiny seed, something like a lettuce or maybe a petunia seed that's so small, then most of the time those are just surface sown. They're just dropped on the surface. And that's when your germinating mix comes in because it's a really fine mix. So you can take those fine seeds, put them on the surface, and then often you can just take some vermiculite um, and just dust over the top of that. And that'll just cover it enough to have a little bit of moisture, uh, keep the moisture even on it. And then when you water that in, it'll just pop up from the surface. Now, some seeds uh, are surface sown because they need that light to germinate. Uh, you'll often see on your seed packets uh, whether a, a plant needs or whether a seed needs light to germinate or whether it needs dark and the ones that need dark doesn't mean you need to stick in the closet that means the seed needs to be sufficiently covered in order to be fairly dark the ones that are light need to sort of be surface sown so a lot of your seed packets will actually say on there uh, germination requirement light or dark now if you're getting into, into specialty crops there's quite a bit of variation as far as requirements for germination but we'll stick with the basic vegetable crops today. You get into some of the more specialty nursery crops, flower crops, that's a lot more complicated. But basically everything can be sown at twice its depth and you're good to go. Very fine seeds. Uh, I have this little tool, it came from Jung Seed Company a long time ago. 
Uh, this is handy for sowing little seeds. How do you how do you sow seeds? Uh, this is a little tool. There's lots of variations of these. They have different size holes that allow maybe a seed or two at a time. And you just tap that into your place. Now we do a lot of seed sowing in these trays and uh, the smaller trays. And I'll do that by hand a lot of times. A lot of times I'll, I'll use a tool, but often I'll just use a seed packet. I'll just crease a seed packet and, and use that to tap one or two seeds in at a time. Uh, that just comes from practice. We sow thousands and thousands of seeds. But this tool right here makes it a lot easier if you're talking about sowing um, small seeds. If not, just use your fingers or tweezers or something. Put that seed where it needs to be at the proper depth. The other thing that seeds need to germinate are moisture and then after that, temperature. So temperature is pretty easy. Uh, room temperature is fine, 65, 70, seeds will all germinate at that temperature. Now there's a wide range of, of germination temperatures for crops. Like spinach can germinate way down to 40. And in fact, if the soil temperature is above, uh, if it's above something like 75 or 80, spinach seed won't germinate at all. It's a cold season crop. So oftentimes we have to, in the summer when we're starting our fall spinach, stick that in the refrigerator cool it down in order that it will germinate before we can plant it out in the field. Uh, but room temperature is good for most things. If you want to get it up a little faster, you can use a heat mat and that just heats the soil, makes it, takes it up to 80, 85. You can set your thermostat however hot you like it. We'll use that for our hot peppers sometimes because they really like a high germination temperature and we get them up growing really fast. But room temperature works for the most part. And then you just want to water those seeds in, maintaining a proper moisture. Now, the proper moisture is moist, but not wet. So that's the rule for that. Uh, keep it moist. And if you use a good quality soil mix, then it's going to drain well and, and keep a, about the right moisture. If you use something that's heavier, a lot of times there's going to be a lot of moisture. If you make the mistake of not putting a, a hole in your seed container, it's going to fill with water. That's going to cause a lot of moisture. It's going to cause the seed may germinate, but it will probably damp off. All the funguses will grow and um, your seed will probably die. You see that a lot of people overwater their transplants. Uh, a little fungus will come into the base of that and that's damping off and they'll rot off. So if you use a good soil mix, you'll do away with that problem that happens an awful lot. Okay, so you've watered it in. Uh, it should be a proper temperature and the, and the seed should come up. Now, where do we put it? Placing is very important, and this is the biggest mistake people make. They think they can start seeds in a windowsill, and I have never seen a windowsill that's adequate for producing good transplants. They will grow, they will germinate. Even if you have this nice bay window facing to the south, you may be okay. But uh, this time of year, when we're starting seeds in the northern hemisphere, the sun's low on the horizon, so that sun's coming at a direct angle. So that plant, no matter how much light it's getting, is stretching towards that light. The light is not directly over the plant. So that's going to make a leggy plant that stretches. And often there's not enough daylight. Um, even six, eight, ten hours is not necessarily enough to produce a good transplant this time of year. So if you're growing inside, if you don't have a greenhouse, now I know a greenhouse is ideal. Um, and that's the best place, a heated greenhouse, because you get full light. But you're going to have to use uh, grow lights if you're going to grow in your house, in your basement, even in your kitchen you're gonna need some kind of supplemental lighting. You can produce transplants without it, but they're not gonna be good transplants. They're gonna be sort of leggy. They're always gonna be at a disadvantage. Um, that's a big mistake that people make. So just go ahead and invest in some kind of supplemental lighting. Lighting is pretty cheap. All you have to have is a table, uh, set up a couple shop lights. Fluorescent shop lights is what has been used for years and years. Uh, I would probably go on and go with LEDs. Those fluorescent lights, the bulbs will burn out. They'll have to be replaced. They get dim. Over just a couple of years, they're going to start getting dim. Um, so LEDs will, I don't think they hardly ever burn out. Uh, maybe a little more expensive initially, but you're not going to have to replace bulbs. So go ahead and get the LED lights. They actually make those in different colors so that it's more of a plant spectrum. So you can get those specifically for plants. And either way, you're going to have to have that, um, that light really close to the transplants. Another mistake people make is put the plants up really high. Sometimes I'll put mine really high and cheat and try to get in several trays. But you're better off and you need to put them directly over the plant tray within three or four inches. And that keeps that plant uh, in the direct light. It prevents it from being leggy and it makes a nice transplant. If you, if you hang a light too high, then that plant's just going to stretch. and It's not going to get enough light. So that's another tip to remember. 
I also like to, especially when I'm talking about um, sowing very fine seed, is to use a dedicated garden sprayer to water those in. Now you can use a watering can or a water hose or a faucet or something like that, but what you're gonna do if you have really fine seed, especially if they're surface sowed, you're gonna wash those out. You're going to maybe either bury them too deep or, or wash them to the surface where they don't have the proper depth. So initially, especially when you're, when you're watering in your seeds you've just sowed for the first time, go ahead and use a garden sprayer. You can put down a fine mist and just uh, gently water those seeds in. So once they get wet initially, they're gonna stay at that depth that you planted them instead of washing too high or too low. So that's another mistake that a lot of people make that when I, I figured that one out myself, believe me, after I've uh, dosed a whole tray of seeds with a watering can or a water hose and it's shot my soil and my seeds in, in all different places, then that was a, a lesson learned. So maybe I'll help you out with that one. Another tip for starting seeds, and especially if you start a lot of seeds, this is not a big deal if you've only got a few seeds you're starting, but if you're like us, <laughs> we start a lot of seeds, and I've made this mistake many times before, label, label, label. Uh, it, we will have uh, 20 different trays of, um, of broccoli and cabbage and kale that has to go in sort of a succession planting. We'll have different varieties, so we kind of need to know when they're planted, where they're planted so that we know when to harvest them. And then if we lose our labels or the labels are lost and we don't know what variety we have, I hate that worse than anything. Uh, so I over label for the most part. So you can use anything to label your plants. I have uh, the little plant standard white plant tags are good. Write on those with a Sharpie, but make sure it's like a, a fade resistant Sharpie. Sharpie will fade pretty quickly in the sun. This one's a Sharpie Extreme. They make some that will last a little longer. Sharpie works for just a, a couple weeks. Uh, but remember, if you're going to put that in the garden, it's probably going to fade. Pencil lasts, actually pencil lasts longer. It's not going to fade like a Sharpie does. You can use these plant tags. We use a lot of those. Um, you can actually cut your own plastic plant tags from vinyl siding. Get some old scraps of vinyl, any kind of plastic, and use pencil on those. Wax pencil, maybe. Um, and those make good plant tags. Some of the cheaper ones that are um, uh, recyclable are uh, popsicle sticks. So uh, we use those as well. Big ones, small ones. One thing I've been using more, more and more is actually masking tape. I found that if I actually label the side of a tray with masking tape, and then I write on that with a Sharpie, it, it hardly ever fades, and I can't lose it. If we have a plant tag sticking up and I'm transferring a lot of trays, that pops out, and I don't even know where to put it back. Uh, so uh, duct tape, or I mean masking tape's not gonna go anywhere and I've been using that um, for labeling most of our trays these days, and it works pretty well. So some kind of label so you know what you've got. Uh, you can actually use the aluminum. If, if it's something permanent you're starting, that you maybe a perennial or something that you really wanna keep track of, a certain variety, then you can use some of those aluminum um, labels that, that, are, that are never gonna fade because it's actually a physical impression on the tag. And I use those for a lot of our, if I'm doing a fruit tree or perennial that I wanna keep track of, I'll make sure I label it with one of those. Because if you don't write it down, it never happened. Something to mention that I, that I touched on earlier was that uh, soil mix in general has a touch of fertilizer in a lot of it, but that is not enough to actually grow that transplant to maturity. You're gonna have to fertilize your transplants. And a, a mistake people make is to dose them with miracle Grow uh, and burn them up. Uh, remember that plant is only this big. It doesn't need initially a lot of fertility. As it gets bigger, it's gonna need a lot more, but it would be a mistake to use a really heavy concentrated uh, chemical fertilizer on young transplants. They're very tender and they're going to be burned uh, by that. The other thing is that when they are ready to go into the garden, they're not really ready to go into the garden. And I'm talking about hardening off your transplants. Now you can't take a greenhouse, uh, a greenhouse grown plant or a plant that's been grown in your basement that's only been subjected to artificial light and then just throw that out into the garden when it's time to plant. That plant is going to uh, suffer badly. Number one, it's not used to direct sunlight. Uh, even in a greenhouse, there's a covering over the greenhouse so you're not getting the full, the full light spectrum through that plastic. Uh, so when you even move it from a greenhouse where it's getting sun outside, um, it's going to burn. Those tissues are not used to receiving all that that power from the sun, so they have to. The plant has to adjust. So, to letting that that plant adjust, or we call it hardening off, 
is a, is a combination of things. Number one, it's, it's light. So I like to set plants out from the greenhouse on a cloudy day. That kind of gives them a smooth transition. I'll set them out for five, six hours a day and then set them back in the greenhouse at night. I'll do that for several days before I know I'm going to plant them out. You can also withhold water. You want to sort of let the transplants dry down a little bit. It's okay if they wilt just a little bit. That, that plant will respond well to that. When you water it again, it's sort of hardening it off, making it ready for the natural environment outside where it's going to get dry, it's going to get hot, it's going to be windy. And that's the other thing. If you have a transplant that comes from inside, it's never going to be subjected to wind unless you put a fan on it, which that actually helps. I do that a lot in the greenhouse. I'll have fans running over the transplants and that gives them some of that natural wind motion. It makes the roots actually stronger, it makes a nice stocky uh, stem. So if you ever see our transplants, they're gonna have a really thick stem. And we use that, we do that because we put a little, a little air movement on them. And the other thing we do is we keep a little bit of a cooler greenhouse. Uh, if you grow those uh, plants at a little cooler temperature, then they tend to be a little shorter and stockier. If you give them 85 and fertilizer and sun all the time, they're going to shoot right up and they're going to tend to be a little bit leggy. Uh, we like to keep them a little bit slower growing, a little stockier. It makes for a healthier transplant when they go in the field. So you can do that same thing as well. Now I know that was a whirlwind tour of seed starting. I'm sure I didn't cover everything because there's a lot of details to cover. But those were the basic principles that should give you all the information you need to get started sowing your own seeds. So jump right in there, uh, follow the basic principles, and you should have good success. And I look forward to hearing about uh, your garden this year, all those transplants that you started, maybe for the very first time. If you have other questions that I didn't answer, just leave those in the comments below and I'll try to answer them as well. So that's all for today, folks. Stay warm and we'll see you next time. Thank you.